Hi. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to come here and tell you about our work. Uh, as Steve said, uh, I've spent virtually my entire career at Johns Hopkins, uh, starting as a medical student um, over 30 years ago. Um, after graduating from the MD-PhD program, I decided not to pursue any further clinical training uh, and took a position at the, what's now called the Carnegie Institution of Science. And uh, there I had a, a position that would, that's analogous to the Whitehead Fellow position here at MIT, so I was given complete independence, uh, but I was expected to leave in a few years. Um, and I remember that my very first day there, the director of the institute, Don Brown, walked me up to what would be my new lab um, and said something to the effect of, okay, go, go do something interesting and important. So as you can imagine, being fresh out of graduate school, um, it was nothing short of exhilarating for me to be thinking that I could pretty much, I'd answer to nobody and could pretty much do anything that I felt like. Uh, but at the same time, of course, it was just overwhelmingly intimidating to be standing there staring at these completely bare labs and having to think about what it was that I was actually going to be doing. So in the end, uh, I decided to pursue a group of proteins called the TGF-beta superfamilies, a group of signaling molecules. And I got interested in this group of proteins because they were known to be potent regulators of cell growth and cell differentiation. And because these normally act from outside the cell, it was easy to envision how one might ultimately exploit the activities of these molecules for clinical applications. Now, at the time that I got interested uh, in this group of proteins, about a dozen or so family members had been known. Um, and uh, it seemed likely to me that there would be many more yet to be identified. And so I set out to try to find new family members, uh, essentially by just making guesses as to what these new genes might look like. And so this is work that I started at Carnegie and then continued when I moved my lab back to Johns Hopkins. And that approach uh, worked well, and so we identified a large number of new members of this uh, signaling molecule family. And then that's when the hard work began, which was to try to figure out what the biological functions of these molecules might be. Uh, as you might imagine, that took us in many, many different directions because we pretty much just went wherever the biology took us. Um, and uh, in those days, you could walk into my lab, go from bench to bench, and there'd be almost no connection that you'd find from one project to the next. Well, all of that changed uh, when we figured out the function of one of these molecules that we called myostatin. And uh, the function of myostatin became apparent when we generated mice that lacked uh, the gene altogether. And uh, it turned out that in these mice, uh, all the skeletal muscles in the body grew to be about twice the normal size. So uh, this generated a lot of stir, and, and, and these mice uh, became known in the popular press as real-life mighty mice. Um, and uh, so in the ensuing years then, um, my lab uh, has spent a lot of effort trying to understand how mystatin works, how it signals, how it's regulated, um, what the effects are in tampering with this pathway in models of human disease in mice, and so forth. Um, and uh, this research uh, very rapidly expanded beyond the borders of my own lab. Uh, so now if you do a search um, through PubMed, a literature search, uh, with the term myostatin, you'll pull up maybe 1,500 papers or so. Um, and it's created um, what can only be described as really a frenzy of activity in the pharmaceutical world, trying to develop drugs to target this pathway. Um, in fact, a number of major pharmaceutical companies have developed myostatin inhibitors, and by my count, uh, there are currently, um, I think, eight uh, phase two trials underway with various myostatin inhibitors from companies like Novartis and uh, Eli Lilly, Regeneron, and so forth. So um, uh, based on um, the trickle of data that seems to have come out, uh, that have leaked out of the companies um, regarding these trials, uh, it seems likely that this, this process, that this uh, strategy will work to increase uh, muscle mass in humans. And I think the real question is, is now in whether that's going to actually lead to some kind of clinical benefit. And in my opinion, the real challenge moving forward is going to be to identify those disease states in which uh, hitting this pathway is going to provide therapeutic benefit, um, and then to be able to match those with the appropriate mystatin inhibitors. Uh, so what might those disease states be? Well, there's been um, a lot of focus on primary muscle degenerative diseases like muscular dystrophy, 
Uh, the idea is that the muscle is degenerating, but perhaps you could compensate for it by building extra muscle. Uh, but then there are lots and lots of other disease states in which muscle loss is a problem. So there are lots of settings of acute muscle loss, uh, what's termed cachexia, which is seen in uh, patients with lots of diseases, uh, most notably things like cancer, AIDS, uh, COPD, uh, kidney failure, heart failure. You could just go down the list. Um, the real pie in the sky um, would be uh, the muscle loss that occurs during aging. So uh, we, will, we all age, and we will all lose muscle mass. And for some of us, uh, that will become debilitating. And so the question is, could hitting this pathway um, ultimately uh, put a dent uh, into that, um, uh, into um, that kind of muscle loss. Um, so um, we still, uh, so we've come a long way, you know, from what started as, as just a little gene sequence. Um, and um, hopefully some of these uh, applications will pan out, but uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and in many ways, uh, the real challenge has just begun. So as I reflect back on um, at least my story, um, I think two things uh, become very clear to me uh, in that context. Uh, the first is that um, although we've been very fortunate in that uh, there's been an incredible amount of progress that's been made in terms of uh, taking these uh, discoveries and um, taking them uh, into the clinic, um, I think um, it's important to keep in mind that this started as what can only be described as a pure basic science project. Uh, so we were interested in understanding how cells signal to one another um, and uh, really not knowing exactly where that was going to lead. Um, and in fact, even after we understood the function of myostatin, and even after it was obvious to everybody what the potential therapeutic benefits could be in targeting this pathway, we decided to stay focused as much as possible on the basic science, really trying to elucidate the regulatory and signaling mechanisms underlying myostatin activity. And I believe that uh, that was really uh, an important part of um, the process in terms of being able to develop the tools and the strategies, uh, not only to pursue the, the preclinical studies, but ultimately also to get to the clinical studies. Uh, the second thing uh, that I think is very clear to me is that really none of this would have been possible without an early uh, source of funding that we had from a biotech company here in Cambridge. So unbeknownst to me at the time that I started this work, uh, unbeknownst to me mainly because I was one of the idiots that Steve's referring to in medical school classes, um, but apparently uh, this family of proteins uh, was of considerable interest uh, to the biotech community and in fact uh, there was one company here in Cambridge, uh, Genetics Institute, which uh, eventually became part of Wyeth and then became part of Pfizer, uh, that had essentially an identical research program underway to find new members of the TGF beta family. So I managed to convince them very early on uh, to support our work, um, which turned out to be a very easy sell. And uh, they were able to provide the resources uh, necessary for us to really pursue what we thought would be the most interesting and important biology without having to worry about you know, where our next paper was gonna come from, where our next grant was gonna come from. And so we were able to take uh, some really long-term and risky uh, types of approaches uh, that would never have been funded by NIH. And in fact, um, our very first two publications on myostatin in 1997, which uh, really are two of the most important papers I've certainly published, um, so the, the first one was in Nature, describing the discovery of myostatin and the effect of uh, eliminating this gene in mice. Uh, the second was the cloning of the myostatin gene from many different species and the identification of naturally occurring mutations in the myostatin gene in very heavily muscled breeds of cattle. All of that work leading up to those two publications was actually supported uh, without an NIH grant to my lab. So I think uh, that's just an illustration of uh, really the power of uh, funding uh, put in at the right place at the right time, um, which can supplement uh, the types of funding that are traditionally funded by NIH, uh, which of course, uh, even that is hard to come by these days. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.